Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, do we have the other microphone, the red one? This one's an echo. If you haven't already noticed, there, is a, there are refreshments in the back. Please do help yourself at any time. Don't hesitate to get up even during the middle of the talk uh, and to enjoy yourself with the night ta'ala. Aisha is at 9.15, uh, so we'll go up until that time with the night ta'ala. Okay, so while he fixes the, uh, the echo, which it seems like it's fixed, we'll go ahead and begin. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, amma ba'd. Some time ago, there was a sultan who had a close relationship with his wazir, the minister. And the minister was someone who seems to have been a little bit more Islamically committed and, and righteous. And this minister had the habit of saying, لَعَلَّهُ خَيْرٌ Perhaps there's good in it. Inshallah, there's good in it. And so every time something would happen, لَعَلَّهُ خَيْرٌ Perhaps there's good in it. Every time. Now, maybe you know someone like this. If you're not on the same wavelength as this person, they become very annoying. Very annoying. They'll take a big issue. لَعَلَّهُ خَيْرٌ And they're so calm about it. It's like, why aren't you seeing it the way I'm seeing it? It becomes frustrating. And so the Sultan never really thought too much about it until one day something, an accident happened with the Sultan and he was cut. A pretty deep cut. And the Sultan is of course agitated. And so his minister says, لَعَلَّهُ خير, لَعَلَّهُ خير. This time the Sultan just didn't have it. He's like, put him in jail. Puts him in jail. Right? And then the Sultan forgets about him and he goes on a trip with a bunch of people. And on this trip, bandits come and they capture the sultan and the people around him. And these bandits were pagans. And they wanted to sacrifice a human being for their god, to please their god. And so they choose the sultan. He's the seemingly the most the wealthiest and the most well-looking or whatever his features were. Yeah, he was he seemed like he, he can get the, the the he was eligible to be sacrificed. So they Take the sultan, put him on the altar, and just before they sacrificed him, one of the bystanders said, wait, wait, wait. Let him go. He, we can't sacrifice him. Why? What's wrong? He has this big cut on his arm. He is imperfect. He's not worthy of being sacrificed. So they let him go. So the sultan goes back, and he tells his people, bring me the minister, free him. And he tells the minister what happened. He said, you know what? You were right. Perhaps there was good in it. There was good in it for me, but you've been in jail all this time. What was the good in it for you? said, if I was with you, if I wasn't in jail, I would have been with you and they would have sacrificed me instead. So the, the Sultan laughed and alhamdulillah, there was khair in it. But as I was mentioning earlier, if you're not on the same, same wavelength as this person, it becomes very agitating. So what's going on here? What's the lesson here? One of the lessons here. In order to understand the world properly, we need a proper world view. This wazir understood the world as it should be understood, and therefore, لَعَلَّهُ خير. Perhaps there is good in it. He, understand, he understood something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's involvement in his world, in this, in this universe, in his creation, where he understood that every, there's good in everything, and there's good meant to be, in everything. But the Sultan didn't reach that level of understanding the world. And so he was just not on the same, same wavelength as this wazir. And this top, this series that we start, that we're starting today, ta'ala, I've titled it Live Islam. We want to live according to Islam, Aqidah and ethics. We're going to dive into the Aqidah of our faith. And these points, the pillars of faith, I'm assuming you all are familiar with that. Maybe you don't know the nuanced, it, uh, uh, the itty-bitty details of these topics. And we're not going to go in those nuanced uh, debates and discussions. Rather, what I would like to do, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq, is to understand aqidah to where it builds a world view. And through that world view, we develop ethics. 
We develop principles. We develop a lifestyle. You see, we live in the West today. And for many of you, I'm looking at you, I'm assuming that you born and raised in some Eastern country or Middle Eastern country, and you came here. And I can only imagine, in fact, I don't need to imagine because I went through a period like this, the culture shock that you had to kind of deal with when you first came to America. Man, this is a very different world. And for those who, are more rec who have more recently came to America, it's, even, it's an even greater challenge. Now, I understand or kind of uh, have a bit of idea of what that feels because well, I was born and raised here and I went to Jordan and I had a culture shock. I couldn't understand how people were thinking. And I remember one discussion that I had of all places in the bathroom of my, the college that I went to. And this was at the peak of the Arab Spring. And you had people calling for democracy and democracy and democracy and democracy. And so in my university, it was meant, to, it's supposed to be an Islamic university, right? It's supposed to be an Islamic university. But you had this guy in the bathroom smoking. And the policy of the uh, university, and again, I, I've been in this country for less than a year now. I still didn't realize that a police officer will be standing under a no smoking sign, smoking in the hospital, right, of all places. I still didn't get that. So I tell this young man, I'm like, literally the doors outside are just a few steps away. Go outside. And you had one of my classmates come and said, no, we, this is a democratic state. We have freedom. He has the freedom to do that. And I just look at this guy, and I'm shocked. I'm like, wow, you really don't know what democracy is, nor do you know what freedom is. And from that moment, I knew that the Arab Spring was going to fail. Not that I wanted it to fail. I just knew. Why? Because democracy is a worldview or a political view that influences behaviors. Here in America, people come, they'll see you praying. They'll see you praying. They'll look at you, huh, interesting, and they'll continue on their, on their day. Why? Well, they have the freedom to do that. It's a worldview. And so the worldview that we have influences our behaviors. And the first topic, inshallah, we will start with for, for this journey of our aqidah is one that is meant to shape a very broad macro worldview, and that is the topic of qada and qada, which I'm translating as divine order and decree. Divine order meaning qada, and divine decree meaning qada. This is a very macro idea that is a pillar of Islam. When the Prophet ﷺ was approached by Jibreel in the very well known hadith, he asked the Prophet ﷺ, What is Iman? He mentioned to believe in Tawheed and the Day of Judgment, and the Angels, and the Prophets, and Revelation, وَالْقَدَرْ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ And to believe in Qadr, in divine order, whether we perceive it to be good or bad. And so, what is this Qadr? What is Qadr? And how is it meant to shape our worldview? And to give you one more example on why it's so important to understand the worldview from Islamic paradigm, I'll give you just one example. And we have, alhamdulillah, a pretty diverse age range here. If I were to mention the hadith, which I gave a khutbah about last, last Friday, about the Prophet ﷺ talking to women and saying, the best women, the best wives, in amaraha ata'atu, ta'atu. When her husband commands her to do something, she obeys. Now for the older generation, yeah, okay, I understand. What's next? Younger generation, what? The, the Prophet really said that? No, no, no way. This has to be a, a weak hadith. It has to be a weak hadith. No, no, it's an authentic hadith. No, no, there must be something else. There must be something else going on. Why is it that the older generation, it, it's common sense. I mean, it doesn't seem to be a problem. Yeah, maybe there are bad men out there. Maybe there are some men they would rather not listen to. But the idea of a wife kind of cooperating with her husband is common sense. But for the younger ones, it's, you're going to start a revolution off of this. Why? Well, look at the principles and the ideas taught in the West. It shapes a world view. When our children go to school and they're taught about science, they're not just taught about information. They're taught about how to view the world. When I talk to these youth, dating is haram. Yeah, Shaykh, why? It's just Allah said so. 
Allah and his messenger said, Shaykh, why? Because when you look at science and statistics, those who don't date have a better chance of love and successful marriage. Oh, okay, that makes sense. When science is the argument, it makes sense. But when Allah and his messenger are what's being presented, yeah, it's not enough. Where is that coming from, the worldview? So let's dive into Qadha and Qadr, and let's start off by understanding what they are. Qadha, divine order. What does this mean? You see, Newton, we all, we're all familiar with Newton, right? Newton is this scientist, very brilliant man, one of the geniuses of modern times. When Newton was sitting under a tree, a very famous story, sitting under a tree, an apple falls and hit him. And he makes a very brilliant comment. He says, I don't know why the apple fell, but I know something caused it to fall. I, know why, I, I don't know why it fell, but something caused it to fall. And so he looks into gravity and he presents the theory of gravity, which has revolutionized modern day science. And so, Qadr, what is that? He understood the science behind it, he, he didn't understand the why. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu bi qadr. Indeed, we created everything with qadr. In another verse in beginning Surah Al Furqan, wa khalaqa kulla shay'in faqaddarahu taqdira. Allah created everything and He gave it a particular, specific qadr. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about? Here, Allah is talking about creation as a whole. You're looking at the earth and all that goes on in the natural part of the earth. You're looking at the universe, astrophysics, physics, all the nine yards when it comes to the science and all the fields of science. Allah created everything with a qadr. Now in the Arabic language, the word miqdar is used often in uh, cooking, right? If you want to cook, you, you use miqdar mil'aqa, min as-sukkar, for example. You use a miqdar, a portion of one tablespoon for, uh, of, of sugar. What does that mean? Well, when you cook something, you're not only trying to get a particular taste, you're trying to get a particular shape, a particular texture, and that requires proportioning what you include in this meal. If you put too much salt, you can't eat it. You put too little salt, it's bland. You put too much oil, it doesn't taste good. Too little oil, it might become dry or might even burn. So you add a particular portion of something to get a particular result. Similarly, when Allah created the universe, He created everything with a very particular portion so that it functions in a particular way. And so what is Qadr? Qadr is a system which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to organize the entire universe. Science comes to explain and to unlock that qadr. So we know that, for example, the theories of gravity, and if we want to throw something, we can precisely calculate based on the uh, energy that is exerted when it's thrown and based on the height it, it was thrown uh, at and the power, we can determine exactly how far it's going to go. Why? Because Allah created the universe in a qadr, in a system. And we find this consistency. We can predict when it rains. Well, why? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the atmosphere in a particular qadr, in this system. We learn it, we study it, we unlock it, and thus we're able to predict when it's going to rain. But notice Newton. He understood the how, but he didn't know why. Why do these things happen? That's a very different question than how it happens. So the first tool to unlocking this idea of qada to where it builds our worldview is to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this universe in a very, very particular, unique way. And we will build on that, inshallah, uh, soon to come. The second point of qada is that qada is purpose-driven. So Newton understood how, didn't understand why. Why did it fall? What was the purpose of it falling? Why did it fall at this particular moment to where it hit my head? And here there's another example, another story. A young man sitting on a very large tree, under a very large tree, looks up in the tree above him and sees these small fruits. Large tree producing very small fruits. And he looks over there and sees a garden of watermelons. 
Now, watermelons grow from the ground, and they, they grow on very thin stems. So he's sitting there thinking, you know, why did God give this, these small fruits this very large tree? But this very large, uh, these very large watermelons are growing on very thin and small stems. I mean, it would seem like it should be the opposite. Large fruits need large trees, whereas small fruits need smaller stems. And it just so happened that while he was thinking about this, the fruit above him falls, hits him in the head. He says, okay, now I understand why. Imagine if that was a watermelon that fell on me. He understood the wisdom why there is a purpose. And this here is where the Western world really diverges from the Islamic uh, framework. Islam and science have never been kind of, have never went through the struggle of we don't see eye to eye. In fact, quite the opposite. The more you find that Muslims are committed to their faith, you, the more you find scientists and inventors and these geniuses in the worldly fields and the secular fields. But as soon as Muslims become less and less committed, we, become, we fall behind intellectually and technologically. So uh, science and Islam have always been on the same page. Why? Because science is explaining Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. There is no contradiction here. But where the Western world really get, goes away is to say the following. All that goes on in the world, the sun rising, the sun setting, the moon rising, and the, the phases of the moon, the different weather patterns, all that goes on is for absolutely no reason. It's neutral. It's meaningless. Right? But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ أَمْرِهِ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get the results he has decreed. And those results will come through his qadr, the way he wants it to come. The things that go on aren't void of purpose. There is a meaning. And so the wazir, going back to that first story we began with, he understood this. A qadr happened, the sultan's arm was cut. And the wazir understood that no qadr happens except for a reason, for a purpose. He understood this. It was rooted, ingrained in his heart. So it was easy for him to say, la'allahu khayr. There's good in it. There has to be. Because the one who decreed that to happen is Rabbil Alameen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't decree things void of purpose. Everything happens for a purpose. This Newton sitting there under the tree, I don't know why the apple fell. I just know something caused it to fall. Islam can come and explain why it fell. You know why it fell, Newton? So that you can discover gravity. So that the rest of the universe, the rest of the humanity benefits from that. That's why it fell. Subhanallah. Inna amrihi qad Allahu li kulli shayin qadra. Another example. Alam tara anna allaha yuzji sahaban thumma yu'allifu baynahu thumma yaj'aluhu rukama. Have you now seen how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes the, the clouds to, to move? And then the clouds come and they become larger and larger by combining. And then rain or hail comes down from, this, from these clouds. Uh, and then it causes it to rain. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the qadr, Yes, the, you, can, uh, you can understand the meteorology behind it. But in the end, فَيُصِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَصْرِفُهُ عَمَّنْ يَشَاءُ Allah will cause it to rain upon whom He wills. Notice, He didn't say where He wills. Upon whom He wills. And He causes to rain the clouds to continue going and rain somewhere else. We look outside, you know, in the winter seasons, we're having a drought, we see it's cloudy, and we say, oh my God, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, make it rain. Right? And we sit there and it doesn't rain. It rains somewhere else. Science will come and say, well, it just what happens is what it is. Whereas Islam will say, Allah didn't want it to rain on us. And this opens a whole door of questions that science will never contemplate that helps us build this world view of what's going on. Okay. And then, continuing, qada and qadar, what is qada? Qada is divine decree. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreeing an event. Right? That's one way of understanding qada, uh, divine de decree. 
وقضى وقضينا إلى بني إسرائيل في الكتاب لا تفسدن في الأرض مرتين. Allah has decreed that the children of Israel will create major mischief on earth twice. We're seeing the second of the two right now in the Zionist state. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, this is his qada. This is going to happen whether you like it or not. And inter interestingly enough, when you look at the original, the early generals of the Zionist army, the Israeli army who went and did this and did that. I don't know, someone told me this, but it's such a powerful statement. One of the generals of the Israeli armies said, right, this is Qadr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did he mean by that? What he meant is, if it wasn't for the division within the Muslim Ummah, this would never have happened. Allah wanted this to happen. It's going to happen whether we like it or not. And when, it, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Qadr comes and Qadr comes to remove this state, it's going to happen whether people like it or not. Qadayna ila bani Israel. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He decrees events, causes events to happen. No matter what we try to do, there's nothing we can do to postpone it, to bring it, make it come faster, to not cause it to happen or to cause it to happen. That's one way of understanding qada. Another is Allah's command. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Until the end of these verses. Allah has commanded us, using this word qada. He has commanded us to worship Him alone and to be excellent towards your parents. And then there's a list of uh, commands that come after this verse. So part of Allah's qada is that He commands us to do things. And thus we live by it. And then... Um, Another part of uh, qada is that certain events happen in our lives. مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَمْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ Certain things are going to happen in our lives. Allah has decreed this before we were even created. Things are going to happen. But it's so important to understand this idea so that we build the worldview that will help us develop healthy uh, ethics, healthy principles, and a healthy lifestyle as we'll get to in Naitala. So to sum up, I'm not getting into the itty-bitty details here. I'm giving the general overview that's going to help us build a worldview and thus affect our day-to-day uh, -day lives and lifestyles. So what is in sum? Qada and Qadr. Qada and Qadr is a worldview which centralizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the most important being in existence. So when we look at Qada and Qadr, what is the first step of really making this a pillar of our faith and living by this is to see Allah as central to my life and to all that happens in the world. Nothing happens except by the Qada and Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything has a why. Why the sun rises from the, west, from the east every single day, there's a why behind it. And why is it that at the end of time, the sun will rise from the west? There is a answer to that. In fact, interestingly enough, the answer is because Ibrahim, السلام, when he challenged Nimrud and said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ فَأْتِي بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي كَفَرْ right? Ibrahim challenged Namrud and said, Allah causes the sun to rise from the east. You, if you are truly God, cause it to rise from the west. And so he couldn't do that. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of times will cause the sun to rise from the west to prove that he is the true Lord and that he can do that. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything has a why. Why did it rain? You know, the other day on, on, on uh, Sunday, it kind of lightly rained here in this area out of season. You might, you might answer the question, how did it rain through meteorology? But why did it rain? A whole different array. So, Qadha and Qadr is a worldview which centralizes Allah as the most important being in existence. It also teaches us that the universe is not neutral, allowing us to understand the world. Right? Science comes and it takes a massive existence of the unseen and the angels and the afterlife and paradise and hellfire and Rabbul Alameen and they remove all of that and they just make our existence small. This, that's it. 
All your existence is nothing more than what you see around you. Sam comes and says, no, no, there's a lot more going on. A lot more going on than this. So the Western world, when it comes to building a lifestyle, they fail. Why? Because they don't have all the variables. They don't have qada and qada. You have to work hard in order to succeed. When you look at all these real estate uh, Mongols and uh, these very wealthy people, listen to what they say. Every now and then they'll say, man, a lot of it is luck. Mark Cuban is known as the luckiest billionaire. He even says it, man, I was just really lucky. You listen to real estate and how real estate works. They will say part of real estate is you get lucky. They're saying luck. What Muslim understands is this is Allah's qadr. Allah wanted you to become rich. See, Mark Cuban, he had partners in the first business he sold. I think three or four or five partners. And they all got a billion dollars. His partners all went broke because of the dot-com um, uh, dot uh, bubble and crash. He didn't. They'll explain, oh, I just got lucky. Or they'll try to explain, well, I did this, this, and that. We say Allah wanted you to be rich and didn't want the rest to be rich. That's qada and qada. So the Western world fails when it comes to building a lifestyle. Why? Because they don't have all the variables to build a real lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle. And um, so this is the first major departure. Why things happen around us? Why did it rain? So I mentioned that on, on Sunday it rained. When you ask the question, how did it rain? You can answer that. But when you ask the question, why did Allah make it rain? Whole different ballgame. Why did Allah make it rain on Sunday? You start thinking, well, we're in a major drought. Maybe this small amount of rain has, will save us from a major calamity. It's possible. Right? Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe I'm seeing it right. But it's possible. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His mercy answered someone's dua and cleared the pollution in the, in, the, in the sky, thus making our air a little bit more fresh, keeping us healthy. Meteorology is not going to answer that. Qadha and qadha answers that. Okay. So here we got a, a very basic overview of what qadha and qadr is. Now let's, let's start building the ethics and the benefits of divine decree. How does this build a lifestyle? How does it shape our lifestyle? Well, one thing is, we remember that this is a pillar of Islam. When we say something is a pillar of Islam, what we mean is this is an integral, fundamental part of our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, if we remove this pillar, there's a huge void in our relationship with Allah. This is for all the pillars of Islam and Iman. When one is weak, when one is missing, our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fundamentally flawed. We will not be able to understand it properly. And so it is a pillar of Islam. Um, and therefore, it's huge in our relationship to Allah. But what makes it so important? Well, qada and qadr teaches us that our existence is dependent on Allah. Our existence is dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have so many verses in the Quran. مَن يَهْدِ اللَّهُ فَهُوَ الْمُهْتَدِي مَن يُضْلِلِ اللَّهُ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَا And this is throughout the Quran. Whoever Allah guides, they're the one who's guided. Whoever Allah misguides, they're the one who's misguided. And we here today say, man, what's going on here? What does this really mean? I know if I pray my salah and I give my zakah and I you stay away from the haram, then you know, I'm, I'm doing well, which is true. But Qada and Qada teaches something a lot more integral. It starts to pinpoint the stories of people who lived by Iman, but for whatever reason failed at the end. Or the stories of those who were living a very debauched life, an unethical life. But all of a sudden, they become a believer and they die on Iman. There's more going on than just me, me, me. In fact, if you were to analyze the speech of the people of paradise, how the people of paradise speak, and compare it to how the people of hellfire speak, there is a very major difference. When the people of paradise speak, they will say, Alhamdulillah, Allah is the one who gave us the tawfiq. Allah is the one who helped us. Allah is the one who guide us. We called upon Allah and Allah answered us. This is bifadlillah by the bounties of Allah. But when the people of hellfire speak and they say, Oh Allah, let us go back. Let us go back. They'll say things, we will do good deeds. We will be better. 
I will go ahead and, and follow Iman. What's the difference here? A believer understood that my success is dependent on Allah because of the system of Qada and Qadar. The disbelievers simply never understood that, even while they're in hellfire. It's always about, I can do this, I can do that. As they say in, in Arabic, it's by my own skills that I succeed. Allah and Qadr comes and says, nah, -uh. you are extremely dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about it. Think about it. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah, yumsiku samawati wal -arda an tazula. Allah holds this universe together from falling apart. If it falls apart, who's going to put it back together? And I heard a very beautiful example. There's oxygen in the atmosphere of ours, right? And there's a very, per, 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 uh, there's a very specific percentage of oxygen. It's like 21 or 23 point something percent. Very particular. Now what happens when there's too little oxygen? The world implodes. The world crumbles if there's too little oxygen. What happens if there's too much oxygen? Too much oxygen combusts. It explodes. I remember in this documentary, they said it. We are literally on a very thin line. Go too much to the right, everything burns. Too much to the left, everything implodes. And I was sitting there thinking, I said, subhanAllah. This is Allah's qadr. Allah's qadr that is holding this universe together. Because what we're doing is we're putting things in the atmosphere. I'm not advocating for climate change or anything like that. But we're putting things, we're doing things, there's so many events going on, and we're not sitting there managing the amount of oxygen in the universe, in the earth. Rather, Allah's qadr is doing that. But imagine that. Imagine how fragile this world is. Slight change in what's going on in the atmosphere means the destruction of everything, literally everything. And Allah is saying, He's keeping that together. Can you imagine if things start going a wire? We can't put that back together. It's, it's impossible. But it's Allah's qadr that's interfering and Allah's qadr that's keeping things together. Um, also, among the ethics that we build from qadr and qadr is we attribute our actions to Allah's tawfiq, and I alluded to that. Our success is very dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paving us the road to be Muslims. You know, think of your own lives. I do this, and I have, you know, maybe a few more years in, in terms of some people in the audience, and maybe a few less years than other people. But I can think of a few moments in my life that I say, you know, if it went something another way, I would not be where I'm at today. The time when I was driving with a group of my cousins, we were going to the theaters, and for a moment I wasn't paying attention, going and the car in front of me was stopped. And I, alhamdulillah, was able to go into the other lane and avoid a major accident. I was driving 70. But I think, what if I was a second too late? What if when I turned, when I entered the other lane, there was a car there? It would have been a very different life I'm living today. Or the time when, you know, some of my Muslim friends and my non-Muslim friends, we were having a discussion about Christianity and Islam. And one of my friends, Muslim friends, brings up the name Ahmed Didat. I don't know who he was. And I asked my friend, who's Ahmed Didat? So, you know about him? No. And it just so happened YouTube was new on the scene. Go to YouTube, Ahmed Didat. And he launched my Islamic career. I wonder if I didn't ask my friend who Ahmed Didat was, or he didn't mention him, or I didn't go and YouTube him, my life would be very different. Look, the more we understand the fragility of our lives by looking at the past and how many times we were at this kind of fork in the road where if I made a different decision, my life would be very different. Not for the better. We all have this multiple times. We cannot but be humble and say, if it wasn't for Allah, our lives, we would not be here right now. If it wasn't for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So qada and qadar comes and teaches us Yes, we're responsible, and we'll get to that. We are responsible for making choices. But whoever Allah guides, they're the one who's guided.
And when Allah guides someone, he paves the road for them to be guided, puts the proper moments for them to be influenced and guided, for them to become the best version of themselves. That's Allah's qada and qada. So yeah, we do and we, we hope, we work and we learn. But our hearts, while we work and while we learn, it's not the tawakkul, our hearts, our dependency, our trust is not on ourselves, it's not on our parents, it's not on our friends, it's not on people around us, but rather, Rabbil Alam. Because we understand the fragility of what's going on. So it helps build this worldview that connects our hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by realizing my success is dependent and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qada and qadar paving my road to be a person of paradise. And another ethic that we build off qada and qadar is Allah's presence and care for his creation. You see, a lot of people view God, view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a, as a cop. He's waiting for us to mess up. Like a cop on the side of the road, clocking you, he's kind of in the corner. Can't wait for someone to speed. It's like, I hope that person is speeding. Well, I got a quota to reach. Sitting there, clock, got him, go after him, haha, <laughs> I'm happy because I caught you making a mistake. And try getting yourself out of it. You're not going to get yourself out of it. He's going to write you a ticket and he's going to do it gladly. Because he benefits off of that. Like in Jordan, they actually make commission off the tickets they give you. So, oh man, I can't wait to catch someone. A lot of people have this understanding of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Qada and qada, when you understand it for what it is, gives an entire different paradigm. Rather listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا وَيَعْلَمُ مُسْتَقَرَّهَا وَمُسْتَوْدَعَهَا كُلٌّ فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ There's not a single thing that walks this earth except that Allah has made himself responsible to provide that animal. And you look at how everything is so organized. There are millions, millions upon millions of animals. And each animal is dependent on another animal. And if something goes wrong, it's just a snowball effect. This animal becomes extinct, that animal becomes extinct, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, and it's a catastrophe. But Allah says He is the one who provides every single thing. And you know, in the Arab world, I always used to love this. When you have something and it falls from you, and then you'll find some animal come and, and eat it. We have the saying is that, that that wasn't my riz, it was the riz, riz of the animal. And it's so beautiful. Why? Because it helps us understand Allah's nearness and His care for this universe. So many people look up to the sky and say, where are you, God? Why have you left us? Why have you abandoned? There are literally books written on this. But for us Muslims, all that's going on in the Muslim world, you will find people who are going through the worst difficulties in the most impoverished parts of the Muslim world. Right? And they will say, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide. It's like one reporter in Afghanistan was there talking to one of the Taliban. And he was sitting there eating an apple. And the reporter said, I thought you guys were going through a famine or something like that. Where do you get this apple from? Well, he didn't even say anything. He just looked up. He went like that. He put it to the sky and that's it. Because we know Allah provides us. And when we know Allah provides us, then there's no reason for us to transgress. There's no reason for us to attack, to steal to pillage, to rob. It keeps us ethical. Well, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide one way or another. I have to make the right so, so, uh, choices. I stay within the halal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send. And He always does send. You know, it's an absolute miracle. I always talk, I'm talking a lot about Jordan today. It's an absolute, I find an absolute miracle that Jordan hasn't just collapsed economically from how bad the economic situation is. People go and they eat and it's tough. Very tough. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides. Allah makes a way out. Why? Because Allah is involved in His creation. Allah didn't create the creation to said be. Qada and Qadar is literally saying every single atom, every single motion, every single gust of wind, breeze of wind, every single sunrise and sunset that occurs is reminding each and every one of us Allah cares about us and cares about the universe, and is uh, managing the universe, and is participating in human affairs. He didn't just leave us be. And this beautiful, powerful verse further expands on this. 
Allah has the keys of the unseen. No one knows him except him. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ Allah knows everything in the, on the land and sea. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا And there's not a single leaf that falls from the tree except that Allah knows about it. It's not that he doesn't know, he doesn't care. Every single leaf that seems so irrelevant. A leaf fell, what, what, what does it matter? The tree will reproduce a tree, the, a leaf. The leaf, if it falls, doesn't make any noise, doesn't bother anyone, doesn't change anything. So even the most insignificant things to our affairs, Allah knows about it. And He's part of that process. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ Not a single grain or seed in the darkness and depths of the, uh, or I'm sorry, darkness of the earth. وَلَا رَطْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابِ مُبِينٍ Nothing that is, uh, that is uh, dry or nothing that is moist. Allah knows it all. What is Allah telling us? How concerned, how involved He is in our universe and our affairs. We understand that if anything goes wrong in the world, it's just one after a chain reaction. We're so, it's so fragile. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is managing it all. So that what? So that, as He says, um, so that we don't have to manage the, the atmosphere, the universe, the ecosystem. We do kind of small things here and there. We plant seeds. We water them if there's not enough rain. But the seeds grow and the plants grow and everything happens by itself. So go, enjoy yourself. So that your focus isn't on the worldly affairs. However, وَإِلَيْهِ النُّشُورِ your focus is on the afterlife. Qada and Qadar takes care of most of our lives, most of what's going on, so that we can focus on a small amount of things. Most importantly, the afterlife. Standing in front of Allah, meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also among the ethics of Qada and Qadar is it disciplines our behavior by giving us patience, courage, and relieves stress. A lot of what's going on, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it raining. You don't have to worry about plants growing. All you have to do is put the seed and cover it and the rest is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'll take care of all of that. The apples growing, all, you just have to pick it. That's it. And then you enjoy it. It helps us be patient, builds courage, and relieves stress. So one example from the Quran, ما أصاب من مصيبة في الأرض ولا في أنفسكم I mentioned this one. Um, so Allah made qada and qada and he mentions one of the wisdoms behind it so that you don't grieve and feel regret over what you didn't get sometimes we have ambitions we wanted to be a doctor we wanted to be a lawyer it didn't work out things happened right? Allah saying that's Allah's qada and when we know that this is from Allah, I didn't get become a doctor because Allah didn't want me to become a doctor. My business, this business wasn't successful because Allah didn't want it to be successful. It eases the heart so that we don't regret and grieve over what has passed. And this is a huge point. I don't think I'll have time uh, today, but inshallah next time we'll get into it. Um, it helps relieve that stress. So you're not anxious. What happened? What happened? Happened. Qadr Allahu masha wa fa'al is a powerful term. And so that you don't become overly boastful. Your head doesn't become too big. When you accomplish things, your business is successful. You did become a doctor. You, mashallah, you had many kids. Mashallah, you have a big home. Mashallah, you have this and that. Yeah, Allah's qadr helped you get that. It's not your shatara. It's not your, your skills and mashallah, all on you. Keep that head small. Don't become arrogant. Be humble. So you see how this world view creates a lifestyle that prevents bad and inappropriate characteristics from developing within us. No grief, but don't boast as well. Allah subhanahu wa also says, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبَهِ No calamity occurs except by the permission of Allah. Car accident, maybe a divorce, La samahallah, a death in the family. You lost your business, lost your job. Musibah is a calamity and it hurts. 
and it's tough, and it's a test. We don't become immune to these feelings, but rather when we remember, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it alleviates a lot of that stress. Why? For our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our notion, our belief that Allah only does things that's in our best interest. Allah only does things that benefit us. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not take something from us except because that's not good enough for us. He wants to give us something better. And sometimes, yeah, it's a painful process. But nonetheless, with Allah's qada and qada, for the believer specifically, as Allah says here, وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ Whoever believes in Allah, يَهْدِي قَلْبَ Allah will guide their heart. For the one who believes in Allah, qada and qadar is the grass is greener on the other side. The grass is greener on the other side. Yes, you might have to go to the storm, through a storm. But the believer knows that when a storm comes, despite the loud thunder, despite the uh, lightning, despite the fear that a person fears under such a uh, powerful force, they don't forget that it's raining. And with rain comes greenery, comes, comes lusciousness, comes fruits and vegetation. That's how a believer sees it. So during the test, they remember Allah's qada and qadar, which is meant and engineered to bring good for us, to make us stronger, to make us better, to make us in a better position. The grass is greener on the other side, but only when. When we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides our heart. Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim. Allah knows all. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَمَا كَانَ لِنَفْسٍ أَن تَمُوتَ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ كِتَابًا مُؤَجَّلًا The worst of calamities. No person dies except by the permission of Allah. Kitaban mu'ajjala. This is an appointed time. Everyone has their, point, their time of death. Nothing is going to change that. And so when death actually comes, the believers are the best at coping with death. You know, it's very interesting. Maybe you have a, a non-Muslim co-worker who passed away or something and you look at the process of the funeral. Their bodies stay in the morgue for two weeks. Two weeks. Why is it that long? Whereas the believers, what do we believe? Ikramul mayyit bidafni. Honoring a dead person by burying them quickly. The Prophet teaches us, bury them quickly. Because if they're a good Muslim, then they get to parrot, they get to the afterlife quicker, they'll enjoy that. If they're a bad Muslim, you get them off your shoulders. Our burials are very quick, but the non Muslim burials are very long. It's like they're doing everything possible to postpone what comes after life. And so the believers, through qada and qada, they know when death happens, it's painful. It hurts the heart. We cry. However, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is his qada, nothing is changing it. Go ahead and pause for a moment and I have, uh, well, we'll see. Let's pause for a moment first for I then. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح Oh. 
الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله Okay, so there's still a few more points when it comes to Qadha and Qadar. We'll uh, have our session in two weeks, continue this topic of Qadha and Qadar. Why don't we go ahead and stop here? Uh, if people need to make wudu or if there are any questions, we can go ahead and uh, take a few with Nay Ta'ala. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabi ajma'in wa jazakumullahu khayran. Sure, so that, that's one of the points that we'll come to, inshallah, but I'll go ahead and uh, give a brief uh, overview of that. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ does say لا يرد القضاء إلا الدعاء uh, Nothing changes Allah's qada, His decree except dua So if we view qada and qadr as a system uh, Part of Allah's system is that dua Influences the system if That makes sense So dua comes and it's part of that system It's part of the qada and qadr So when we make dua plays a role because some people come and ask, come and say well if Allah has decreed everything before and Allah has decreed that I'm not going to get this thing then what's the point in making dua and if Allah has decreed that I am going to get, get this thing then what's the point of making dua well the prophet والسلام, says that we have we have to take the means towards reaching something and we'll get to that inshallah next time and part of the means of reaching something is dua so let's say we want to have a successful business. Part of that is studying the business, understanding the market, understanding management, all of that stuff. And among the means is dua, asking Allah for tawfiq. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. So, right. He would never have said that. Right. Yeah. So that's what Ahmadi Dat used to always use. So, uh, yeah, he would say, you know, is this Jesus saying, God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, that, that makes no sense. So that's how he proves that the Quran narrative that it wasn't Isa, or rather, someone who uh, was made to look like Isa. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Right, so again, this is a topic we'll talk about uh, next session in two weeks on August 17th. What I'd say to that is that, yeah, that is Allah's qadr. Because Allah's qadr is that when you work hard, you get results. If you don't work hard, you're not going to get any results and you're going to be poor. Right? So part of Allah's qadr is that which He decrees and there's nothing that changes it but part of Allah's qadr is the taking the means towards doing something and no one is going to become wealthy while sitting down you have to work hard Allah commands us to work to go and uh, succeed right? so yeah it could be abused and misused and so inshallah next time we'll, we'll address these issues to have a more proper understanding of how we uh, uh, make it a practical uh, part of our lives when can we use qadar as, qadar as an excuse? When is, when is it not an excuse? Inshallah, we'll get to that. that that's, that's possible, right? But when someone just says, eh, you know what? Allah wants me to be poor, so I'm going to sit down and do nothing. That's laziness. But someone who's, like for example, you know, look in Syria, for example. A person can work 17 hours and make a few cents. He's working hard, he's doing what he needs. Allah's qadr is that that's his situation. That's when we say this is Allah's qadr. All right. Um, okay, salah is in two minutes. Exactly.